Yankel was a good example of their reactions. The Hitler-Stalin pact had been a bolt from the blue for him. For somebody outside the party, it had been conceivable for the last few years that Russia might come to terms with Germany. For a member of the Communist Party, the mere thought of this was blasphemy. If, on August the 22nd, 1939, you had told Yankel, or any member of the French, English or German Communist Party, that within 24 hours a Soviet-Nazi pact would be signed, and the swastika hoisted in Moscow, he would have either laughed at you or hit you in the face. During the fortnight between the signing of the treaty and the actual outbreak of war, they still tried to convince themselves that the pact was really a supreme stratagem of Stalin's to preserve peace, that is to postpone the final settlement of accounts with Nazism to a more opportune time. But when the war actually broke out, and Russia's betrayal of the anti-fascist cause could no longer be denied, Yankel and his comrades lived for weeks in a sort of daze. Everybody heaped insults on them, shrieked at them, spat on them. But the simple truth about the communist rank and file was that they did not understand what had happened. They were utterly helpless, tottering from the blow they had received, looking in despair for an explanation. The party papers had been suppressed, and the whispered slogans which trickled through from above made neither head nor tail. It was equally hard for a slow-thinking French Renault worker of 45, and for a little Polish Jew of 19, to realise that the messianic belief, to which each in his way had devoted what was purest in him, was a fake. That they had been taken in like fools, born beating and imprisonment for nothing, lost the prospect of advancement in the factory for nothing, suffered, dreamt, quarrelled, argued for years and years, all for nothing. There were several million of them, the toughest, most active and most violently anti-Nazi part of the French working class. They were, by their party tradition and party education, the best fitted to give an example of comradeship and reckless sacrifice in the struggle. They had lived for years in the anti-fascist mystique, and now, at the beginning of the great crusade for which they had been preparing all this time, they were left without leaders. It was an historic opportunity for the French nation to regain control of their enfant terrible. They had but to revive the three words liberté, égalité, fraternité from their heraldic petrifaction, to explode the dynamite latent in the word patriote, when spoken with the accents of Saint-Just and Danton. It was murderous stupidity on the part of the French government to start a police pogrom against the communist rank and file instead of seizing this unique opportunity to win them over. And it was suicidal selfishness on the part of the French ruling class to prevent the war against fascism from becoming an anti-fascist war. The effect of this policy soon became visible. The outward pressure saved Yankel and his friends from the painful task of digging into their consciences. The effect of this policy soon became visible. The outward pressure saved Yankel and his friends from the painful task of digging into their consciences and of repudiating a faith as strong as any religious belief. The Loi des Suspects, the farcical trial of the communist deputies, and the unprecedented wave of political persecution that swept over France cured the communist rank and file of their heretical doubts. Caught between the devil and the deep sea, they opted for the deep sea. They closed their eyes, as they had been trained to do, and took a headlong plunge back into the familiar depths of blind, unquestioning, absolute faith. Then a second event came along which helped them to reaffirm their shaken beliefs. The Red Army marched into Poland. Half of the country was attached, with only a minimum of bloodshed, to the Soviet state. Of course, it was more a conquest by force than a genuine revolution, but had not Lenin himself adopted a similar policy in 1921, when he ordered the troops of the revolution to march against Warsaw? Now Stalin had expanded the radius of the world revolution without declaring war. He had cheated Hitler of half his prey, and once the Nazis were bled white, the Soviet army would march into Germany and throw them out. This was the true signification of the pact. Everything came straight, if you only had the true faith, and the dialectical training to call a table a fishpond.